So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm quite uh, glad to be here. Uh, I enjoy the conference very much. I hope you do enjoy it at least as much as I do. Uh, it's been a while since my last time. My name is Georgi. I'm a developer at SAP. And also, I'm a Bulgarian. And also, I'm a member of the Garden team. So if I should only use one word, I'm a bull gardener. Uh, my name is Tom. I'm also a software engineer uh, on the Garden team, and I work at Pivotal. Cool. Um, today we're going to talk about how did our garden grow during the past year or so. I'm going to risk using this thing. Everybody says it's not working. Let's see. It really is. Oh, it is working. So today we're going to uh, tell you a little bit of history. Uh, then we're going to talk about the cool new stuff uh, that we've been building during the last year, and we're going to finish off with a short glimpse of our uh, short-term future plans. So uh, we know that you normally expect juice on the Garen project of Date Talk, right? So we, we plan like not turning you down on this one. Whoop. <laughs> there you go, juice. Uh, a bit of history. Uh, history of containers in the context of Garden uh, and Cloud Foundry. Uh, where did it all begin, I guess? It all began with the ideas of running uh, with portability and isolation. And these are quite hot topics in today's multi-tenant cloud world. But these ideas are relatively old. Uh, like a short Google search revealed that they date back to at least the 1970s with languages like Smalltalk, uh, running on different platforms in different environments, and the truth is called in the 70s. And then if you fast forward 40 years of history, there is Cloud Foundry. And it's the platform that we know and love. Uh, and Cloud Foundry is all about running uh, multi-tenant applications and doing so securely. So uh, it has genuine interest of the topics of uh, portability and isolation. And when that thing got released, the most hot, like the hottest technology around isolation were these little things, little Linux kernel features called uh, namespaces and cgroups. And what these gave you was the ability of unsharing different aspects of your processes so that they can run without knowing about one another and without stepping on each other's toes. And Cloud Foundry loved that, so it created Project Warden. And this is the great grandparent of uh, Garden. And Warden, it was a small Ruby project, and it orchestrated the low level details, giving, you, uh, giving the platform the ability to do its thing and run the apps securely and so on. Uh, then we decided to rewrite Warren, uh, and uh, we did Garden. Like, you probably know that any name that doesn't start with the G is not a valid name in the Golang uh, land, you know? So Warren became Garden. But it was actually more than just swapping one letter for the other. Uh, we extracted the Garden API, which is a small API describing the platform needs, what the platform needs to be able to do. Uh, and then you could uh, have these swappable uh, backends, swappable implementations of the API, which is great. And this, this was a really good move. It uh, really paid off in the future, you'll see. And then what's next? Oh my god, Docker. Then Docker was released and changed the world. It changed the world of containers, at least. Uh, why was that so? Why was it so uh, such a big deal? Well. Uh, ma mainly because it gave you this killer UX, this really revolutionary way of working with containers. Because container technology is complex, uh, it's really hard for uh, real users to kind of work with these things. And it will be fair to say that Docker invented containers because before them, uh, we had this bunch of syscalls and mounts and primitives that we could combine to build like different sandboxes. But Docker really made this a commodity, really like kind of standardized it, so it was immediately very easy for normal people to just work with these containers. There's this little thing that you can run and move around. Uh, and it was a very big deal. And it was such a big deal that uh, everybody was uh, using it, everybody was calling it, it was a standard. Uh, and we at Cloud Foundry thought, well, everyone's using Docker, maybe we should. So we did this little experiment. Uh, we built a backend that we swapped for our like default backend uh, that will be using Docker. Uh, this experiment didn't quite work uh, because uh, reasons. Like, for example, Docker was a very big monolithic project at that day, and we only needed a little container runtime, which Garen was at that time. It was not really practical to run all of Docker, which was coming with the UX, which we didn't need in the platform, and it 
was very opinionated, would have to be fighting with it all the time. So uh, this plan uh, was dropped on the floor, basically. And then, luckily, like a few years later, the people behind containers, like Docker, CoreOS, uh, they came together and started coming up with real open standards around uh, containers. And so the OCI was born. And the OCI, the Open Container Initiative, this is a set of standards. Uh, for example, the OCI runtime spec is like a standard describing how you run containers. And the OCI image spec is focusing on layered file systems, uh, like the Docker images, as we all know. And there was this cool little thing called Run C. And this was the first implementation of the OCI runtime spec. And this thing was nothing more than Docker's core engine extracted into a small binary that was not opinionated. It was highly configurable. It was very lightweight. And uh, it was actually released under an open foundation. And this was exactly what we needed. So that's why we immediately started building our next um, backend for the Garan API. This marked the beginning of the so-called year of glue uh, for the team. This was a year where we spent like, thinking about all those cool standards that were coming along and how uh, we can possibly bring them to the platform. So the results were that we built uh, the next um, backend, the Garan Run-C, which obviously wraps around Run-C and uses Run-C to run the containers. It's needless to say that we were able to delete a lot of in-house code, so we were now owning a lot less code and better community code. Uh, and we also did another project called GroothFS, and this was a replacement for our image manager, the one that was preparing the rootFSs. Uh, so GroothFS replaced the old one, which was called um, which, which was called the Garden Shed, and to say the least, we didn't like this project very much, so we really wanted to kill it. Uh, so yeah, we were able to delete a lot of code, and at this point, you're probably asking yourselves, like, well, what is this current project doing? Like, uh, it's basically steadily deleting parts of itself. So, uh, what's the future? Where, where are we going? What, what are the Garden team's goals? What is Garden for? Uh, the short answer to this question is that Garden is for Garden's main goal is to bring container technology to the, to the Cloud Foundry platform and do so securely. And to expand a little bit on that, uh, we have like basically we have three goals. First, we need to be the glue that glues together Cloud Foundry to containerization technology. We are exposing all that the platform needs and hiding all the complexity because container tech is complex. Uh, we should be delivering uh, secure defaults because uh, in the multi-tenant world that we live in, this is really important. Uh, we need all the security there is. And we don't want to leave it to the user. Like This is a cloud platform. The user shouldn't care. Uh, so we basically turn all the knobs that we possibly could. And uh, another important goal of the team is to help the platform leverage and like make max use out of the container tech because it's abstracted from it. We're hiding the complexity, and we don't want to be hiding it too well. And this container tech is still being developed. It's a hot thing. So if we spot something that can possibly be uh, good use for like features, we should probably propagate that knowledge upwards in the stack. And now Tom is going to tell us more about what did we do, what cool new things that we do so that we achieve those goals. Great. Uh, do you so, want the clicker? Sure. <laughs> I probably should have practiced using this before I started talking. There we go. So let's talk about glue. Um, there's a few things we've been working on in, in, in sort of the, the glue category. And the first thing I want to talk about are these things called garden peas. Bef before I explain what a garden pea is, you have to really understand what a Kubernetes pod is. So I'm sure a lot of you here are familiar with what a Kubernetes pod is. Let, let, let's just give ourselves a reminder. They're a, a collection of containers that share some stuff between each other. So for example, they might share a network namespace so they can uh, see each other on their own local network. Um, so a, in summary, like a, a Kubernetes pod is like a cluster of container images that are shippable, but they're not entirely isolated from each other. Uh, you're making some security trade-offs for, for some like, nice-to-haves. Um, it turns out that Cloud Foundry had a use case for such a thing. Um, here's a few of them. Um, so you, you may have heard of Envoy. Um, Envoy is a process that does some networky stuff. There are, there are plenty of talks here about Envoy uh, that I'm sure you've seen. But essentially, Envoy, uh, a requirement of that is it, it needs access to the network namespace that a container happens to be using. 
Uh, so Envoy is just a process that runs sort of partially inside the garden container, only sharing the network namespace. Uh, there's another example I can give called a health check. And this is kind of exactly what it says on the tin. It's a process that checks the health of the other process. And uh, the requirement here with, with uh, something analogous to a Kubernetes pod was that we didn't want this health check to eat into your application's memory limits. Your application might have a memory limit of, say, 60 meg, and the health check might be written in Go and consume 6 meg just for the runtime. That, that seems unfair that you'd pay for that. So health checks live outside of, of the, uh, the memory limits of your application, but can still see some things about the application. Uh, there's a few other examples like CF, SSH, et cetera, but we won't, we won't really go into those. Um, so I want to explain like a lame joke about why, why we called this thing garden peas. Um, so if you think about a Kubernetes pod, uh, a pod is a collection of containers. And in Docker world, a container is represented by this fun little whale that someone drew. And now think about a garden. What's a pod a collection of there? Right, it's peas. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying a thing here. You might have heard of test-driven development. We're trying name-driven development, and it seems to be working out so far. Um, so there are some differences between a Kubernetes pod and a garden pea. And that's that garden peas are not user serviceable. We don't want people using Cloud Foundry to have to really think too deeply about them. Uh, really, we want people to just push their code and get a bunch of cool features for, for free. So all that Garden really is doing here with this Garden Peas thing is, is gluing a, a Cloud Foundry experience into low-level implementation details of uh, a concept called sidecar containers. Uh, on the topic of, of glue, we've also been working on uh, some, some more self-deletion. Uh, so Garden's historical decision to replace the hand-rolled container runtime with Run C, it made a lot of engineers very happy and was widely regarded as a good move. Um, it, it was so good, in fact, that we thought, well, let, let's do it again. Um, there were a lot of smart people that worked at Docker, yet again extracted more patterns out of Docker. And we ended up with this thing called Run C. And uh, sorry, with, uh, with a, a thing called Container D. And Container D, uh, it turns out, had a lot of overlap in what it was doing uh, with what Garden was doing, these features we'd built around Run C within Garden. Um, so we thought, that's pretty cool. Um, we should probably use that. Uh, we, we might end up use, like owning less code. We might end up with more eyes on the code that we did use. It's an open source project. Um, and really, it gives us a chance to sort of give back to the community if we adopt this thing and, and start using more of these standards. Um, so that's, that's been going pretty well. Um, uh, we've had a flavor of Garden running in production. Um, a large uh, Cloud Foundry production for a couple of months now. And it's actually been surprisingly stable, relatively bug-free. Um, it has a, exposed a few issues with Garden and a few issues with Container D itself. And this has really given us a chance to contribute back to the community more. We've, we've, in the past couple of years, we've made efforts to contribute back to Run C to fix things like getting it to run rootlessly, that kind of thing. Um, but until quite recently, we never really had a dedicated effort to give back to, to uh, communities for, for products we use, like ContainerD and Run C. So in the past couple of months, we've actually had a, a pair dedicated to just working on open source technology that we happen to use, improving it, fixing bugs, adding features. Uh, and it's, it's been a really cool experience. Um, Next, let's, let's, let's talk about secure defaults. Uh, Gyogi kind of uh, briefly mentioned this earlier. Um, so we use this thing called Run C. And Run C uh, lets you configure a container in such a way that you can add additional layers of security to your container. Um, there are things like user namespaces, app armor, set comp, et cetera. Um, but by default, uh, <clears throat> Run C won't necessarily turn many of these things on for you. And, uh, Garden deployments in Cloud Foundry, we, we want to be as paranoid as possible. We want to be as secure as possible. And then not using those features should be a conscious decision rather than the other way around. Um, so, so by default, Garden actually looks at this, this, this Run C configuration. It, just, it turns on every single security feature we feasibly can turn on. Um, but there is, there's a problem with that. Um, and we, we've kind of secured the container with this big, heavy padlock. But I mean, the, the thing around that container, the gate, has got some pretty big gaps in it, right? We could quite easily just climb through that hole in that fence there and get inside the container. And the, the analogy I'm trying to draw here is that the garden server is still running as a root user, um, which, which seems dangerous. 
Um, and it turns out that you do need to be root to spin up containers in some way. But you don't necessarily have to be root forever. So we've been doing some work on getting the Garden server running rootlessly. And what that means is doing a bunch of rootful setup early in Garden's lifecycle and then quickly dropping to a non-root user. Um, I won't dig too much into the details of that because there was another talk given yesterday um, by another uh, Garden team member, or two of them, Claudia Beresford and Ed King. Um, if you haven't already watched their video on YouTube, it's, it's super interesting. It's about Garden's journey to run the server rootlessly. Um, let's talk about cool container tech we've been working on. Um, so there's this thing called uh, OCI build packs that we've been working on. Let, let, let's step back from OCI build packs for a second and talk about what happens today when you CF push something. Garden will, will, will be asked by Diego to spin up a container. And what it's going to do is it's going to orchestrate with GrootFS to create the file system for your container. And it's going to do that by laying down this root file system. And then it's going to take the, the app bits for the thing that you pushed, like it might contain your Python code and, and the Python runtime. And uh, that data is going to be streamed into the container. And then it's going to be untarred. And then it's going to be layered on top of the root file system. And that, <coughs> excuse me, that really sucks. Um, it sucks for a few reasons. Um, untarring something is quite CPU intensive. Uh, downloading something is quite slow, and it really doesn't cache all that well, the way that we represent it on the disk. <coughs> Excuse me, that was very loud. Um, and uh, so we wanted to address this thing. And if you, if you look at the diagram that I drew here and, and forget the container bit around it, that looks awfully familiar. That looks a lot like uh, a Docker image, uh, a layered file system that a Docker image might give you. And so we thought, why don't we take some ideas from the way that Docker images are constructed and try and apply them to Cloud Foundry? And uh, we, we've sort of like dipped our toe in the water and, and tried to treat the app bits more like an OCI uh, image compatible layer. And uh, we have a deployment of, uh, of Cloud Foundry with this mode enabled. And we've actually seen uh, a 33% performance increase on CF scale uh, by enabling this. So it, it, it's pretty good. There are future plans to, to sort of like fully turn our images into OCI compliant images. Um, another thing that's happened sort of, I want to say almost as a side effect, but we had this in our mind when we were uh, spinning out this uh, Garden API that Georgi mentioned earlier, is that because we've detached the Garden runtime, run C, um, from the API that's used to invoke commands to run C, um, we kind of got Windows support by doing that. Uh, it, it turns out if you take this run C thing and unplug it and then plug in WinC uh, or Wink or Wince, it's pronounced several different ways, I don't know which one's correct, which is a Windows implementation of uh, the run C um, container runtime, it just works. Garden just works on Windows out the box by plugging that other thing instead. Um, so next, Georgi's going to talk about what, what's, what's exciting, what's upcoming uh, in Garden. All right, so what's next? Um, First, we spent a lot of time recently thinking about providing better ways of uh, CPU sharing by providing better CPU metrics. And this is to suggest that we don't think that the current CPU metrics that we're emitting are very good. Uh, this is true, and I'm going to try and explain why this is so. Uh, so CPU sharing is no piece of cake, right? Well, maybe it is in a way. If you think from the app's perspective, uh, the amount of CPU that your app gets uh, for a given moment in time is exactly this. It's a piece of the whole CPU cake on the cell. Uh, so we might, we might play with an example. So if, I push, uh, so if you push today an app to, to Cloud Foundry, which is, say, 64 megabytes big, 64 megabytes of memory, uh, suppose what happens if it lands on an empty or an idle cell where there are no other tenants? Uh, how much CPU is this application going to be able to, to get? Well, uh, it's going to basically be able to eat up the whole cake because there, there's nothing there to prevent that. And that's fine. And when you list your apps like CPU usage, then you're, you're going to see a report of like 100% CPU, provided that your app, for example, does an infinite loop or mines bitcoins or whatever. So we're, you're going to get 100% of CPU usage. And this is fine. There's nobody else there to use up the CPU. But then tomorrow, if, uh, if I push another app of the same size, then it will be fair to like, split the cake into two, like, so that you get 50%, I get 50%. And this is exactly what is going to happen. 
Uh, but if you again list uh, your API metrics today, you're going to see 50% of CPU usage. And this sucks, right? Because this is not a really a metric. Like We need metrics as developers so that we can take decisions based on those metrics. And this metric just dropped by half without me doing anything. So it's not a good metric. Uh, and like in order to make sense of this metric, I need to understand that I'm running in a multi-tenant env, that there are other people, how big are their apps, and how big is the cell, like how big is the whole cake, how, uh, and stuff like that. That th th these are this is no business like of the app developer. As app developers, uh, you shouldn't care about this uh, it, by definition. So how do we plan to address this? Well, instead of today's metric, which is more or less uh, what the machine reports as CPU usage, like not a containerized one, we plan on emitting two new metrics, uh, which will be absolute CPU usage, that is the CPU time, as reported by the kernel, from uh, the moment when the container was created until the present moment, and an entitlement. Uh, and the entitlement is an interesting one. This has the semantics of what you paid for. So this is going to be calculated by the system because the system knows all these details that you shouldn't care about. Like uh, it knows what cell you landed on. So it knows how much memory there is, how much CPU. So it can basically divide all the CPU to proportional entitlements. And then when you get back those two metrics, so the entitlement will be, again, CPU usage in terms of CPU time from uh, content creation up to the present moment, like what we paid for. And when you get these two metrics, it will be trivial to calculate a more stable percentage, which will have the semantics of how much am I using from what I paid for, which makes a lot more sense. And again, if you land on an empty cell, you're going to see like values larger than 100%, but that's fine then you know, like, cool, I'm getting CPU for free. I didn't pay for this. It's fine. But then you can count on this, because tomorrow you might land on a busy cell, uh, and then you won't have this CPU. Uh, so this is, this is like, we feel, a much better way of like, emitting CPU metrics. And this is just the beginning. Uh, this is not going to solve the problem. This is just going to like, expose metrics that describe the problem, more or less. Uh, what would be the next steps? Well, after having these metrics, uh, we will provide some operator tooling so that the operator will be able to list all the apps uh, that are consistently using more than they were paying for. Because it's important, like, uh, we should consider uh, limiting those apps, enforcing the entitlement so that uh, other people won't have, like, pushes that fail, for example, so that other people will be able to spike their CPUs when they need to. Uh, so we're going to collect feedback from those operators. Well, we gave you this list. Do you think this is a, a correct classification? Do you think it will be good to enforce the entitlement on these apps? And if the answer is yes, we're going to automate all of that, and which means that uh, if you consistently use more than your entitlement, you're going to be uh, throttled. The entitlement is going to be enforced so that other people can get a chance uh, to have CPU spikes. And that's how we achieve a better CPU sharing scheme, we believe. So in terms of future plans, uh, rootless container D, although if, I, if I'm true to Teams conventions, I should be calling this rootless container nerd. You know? So what is, what is this all about? Well, given that we're bringing this container thing to the platform, we should make sure that it can run uh, and create containers as a non-root user, uh, because we need all the security. And speaking of container, there's this thing called snapshots. And this is containerd's model of dealing with layered file system. So think Docker images. And this is pretty cool. Uh, it's one level higher than Docker images. It's not bound to any like SHA algorithms or uh, formats like tar, etc. It's pretty cool. And given that GroupFS, uh, our GroupFS component is dealing with exactly the same thing. Uh, we see even more overlap here, so we should probably take this thing and like replace Groot with it. And I guess this is more or less it. So just a short recap. What is Garen for? Garen is glue. It's secure defaults and leveraging container tech for the platform. Uh, what did we do? Uh, we gave you peace, like kind of pods in the Cloud Foundry uh, world. We are bringing container to the platform. We are progressing on our rootless track of work. I know we've been saying this for ages, but we really are getting closer. And we are converting build packs to 
Docker images, and we hope to come up with a better, like a more fair CPU sharing scheme. With that said, we thank you and we welcome your questions. Any questions? Uh, what is the performance win? Uh, if we enable, like the question was, what is the performance gain if we enable the OCI mode? Well, uh, we are noticing, I think Tom mentioned, like about 30% of yes. uh, performance win on CF scale. I think pushes are roughly the same, but scales seem to, to, to benefit the most. For, for some exact numbers on our testing environment where we had this mode enabled, it takes um, six seconds to perform a CF scale, um, going from one instance to 10 instances. And with OCI mode enabled, it takes four seconds. Yeah, uh, so the question, basically the suggestion was that we kind of provide burst capacity for CF pushes, so that we don't immediately limit. Uh, we know about this, this is on our radar. Uh, we think that these two metrics might solve that because we don't intend to like immediately uh, enforce this thing. So you'll be able to burst, but not consistently, like not for a long time. We also spoke about maybe <clears throat> reserving a portion of the CPU that isn't allocated to containers entitlement, which would be a portion that other containers can spike into when they, when they, need, when they need to. Okay. Are we time? We're over. <laughs> Good. Any more questions? If not, we thank you for coming and Thank you.